The midterms are just around the corner, but a string of recent revelations shows that Russia and other foreign actors are using ever more sophisticated methods to poke at the weak leaks in, a, in an uh, already explosive U.S. political environment. Just this week, we found out that Iran was trying its luck as Facebook took down 82 accounts tied to the Ayatollah regime with over 1 million followers combined that were following 33 Facebook accounts, three Facebook groups, and 16 Instagram accounts. But are the social media giants doing enough to protect us from fake news? And just how safe will the ballot box be on November 6th? Joining me now are Ellen Nakashima, national security reporter for The Washington Post, George Beebe, the director for intelligence and national security at the Center for the National Interest, and here in studio with me in Tel Aviv is cybersecurity expert, Eyal Sela. Thank you very much for coming on the show. It is good to see all three of you today. Um, uh, Ellen, I want to start with you. Um, so Facebook recently uh, invited a lot of media to check out its election uh, war room, quite the publicity blitz that they did there. From what you've seen so far, is Facebook doing enough? Well, they certainly have stepped up their activities uh, over the last six, six to eight months or year, really, uh, in, in, large, in large part in response to a lot of the negative publicity they've gotten uh, for not having recognized and acted quickly enough on inter foreign interference in the 2016 elections. Uh, they've nearly doubled the number of uh, people to 20,000 that they have, they say, lo looking to uh, root out um, dis disinformation uh, on, on their platform uh, by, by foreign actors and others. And I think the you know jury is still out as to whether or not this will have a measurable impact. Uh, it's always hard to, to really quantitatively measure what the effect of this sort of uh, disinformation and efforts to manipulate the, the platform have on actual uh, Americans and voters and their perceptions and their attitudes. George, if we, if we stick uh, with the social media uh, question, has this problem gotten better or worse since 2016? Well, I, I would say both, actually. On the one hand, I think this is a growing problem, and it's growing in part because of technology. Increasingly, we're getting a lot of our news from online sources and, and social media in particular. And it's very easy for foreign actors to involve themselves in disseminating information through this medium. So in that sense, this is growing and is likely to continue to grow over time. But when you compare what's going on right now in advance of the midterm elections with what happened uh, in 2016 in the context of the presidential election, I think we're actually seeing less egregious activity, at least on the part of the Russians. Mm. Would you agree with that, Eyal? And how do you think the—I the, the, mean, we, we showed that Facebook was taking down accounts that were linked to Iran, but what about—it's also Google, it's also Twitter. So I think it's interesting that now everyone are tuned into this type of activity, both the government and the technology companies. So everyone is looking at this type of activity, and it would make sense that it would decrease as a result of that. And maybe even we are not, we don't know yet what's going to happen or might, ha might happen, not even in these uh, midterm elections, but next time, uh, maybe they will try new things. But I agree that it will obviously continue as long as it's get the results of making the people distrust the system, uh, the mm -hmm. media, and the democratic system. Mm. Ellen, th these, these countries, they can attack uh, specific campaigns, they can attack uh, the election and voting infrastructure, uh, and they can also, like we just talked about, they can spread propaganda on, on social media. Uh, of those three different ways of, of attacking, what do you believe is the most dangerous today for the United States? Y yes, I mean, in fact, let's keep these, some of these things separate. Uh, attacks on or efforts to disrupt or physically disrupt uh, the election voting machines and infrastructure are separate from uh, misinformation, disinformation campaigns, information warfare campaigns on, on social media platforms. And as George pointed out, we haven't seen the degree of malign activity on social media 
this year in advance of the midterms that we did in 2016. And what the uh, U.S. government officials have been saying consistently for the last several months is they haven't seen any efforts yet by foreign actors to uh, to disrupt the voting infrastructure. But of course, you know we'll see what happens on November 6th on Election Day. Uh, you know whether or not, in fact, there might be something that missed uh, or escaped de detection. What do you, uh, Georgia, over to you. What do you think about that, of those three different uh, ways of attacking, which one is the U.S. currently more uh, susceptible to, and, and is it better prepared uh, than it was uh, back in 2000, 2016? Well, I think uh, Ellen's exactly right. Clearly, the most threatening type of attack would be on the, the voting machines, the electoral systems themselves. We saw in 2016 that the Russians actually probed those voting systems. Uh, a little unclear as to how much penetration of those networks they actually achieved, but there was no question that they were searching for access. Um, and that, I think, is something that we're much more aware of right now than we were in 2016. We've taken some steps to uh, reinforce the resilience of those systems against attacks. But I think clearly we have much more distance to travel before we can breathe easy that there's not really a, a viable threat to those electoral systems. So when you talk about those electoral systems, George, I just want to follow up quickly. Is it far-fetched to think that we could see uh, Russians, for example, meddling with uh, voting numbers and, and tallies after the vote, like we would see the wrong numbers? Well, it's certainly technically feasible. Um, and even if uh, the Russians were not to manipulate the voting numbers in some way, they could actually use disinformation, that is, the, the willful use of, of wrong information to imply that they had messed with the voting numbers. Mm. That could have a very significant effect on popular perceptions. Now, so far, they've done neither. Um, technically feasible, I think, to, to actually get into those systems and manipulate the numbers. We don't have an indication that the Russians have done that or that they intend to do that, but it's something that we very much need to defend against. Hey, the, 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 the Pentagon has also gone on an offensive, and I'm wondering, can a move like what the, the Pentagon is doing, they're calling the Pentagon cyber mission, can it actually stop this kind of meddling, or are they hitting at a, just one drop in a very large ocean? So a few things about the Pentagon offensive. First, personally, as, as much as I could find, I have not uh, heard about too much real offensive. They, they said, or at least what the media said, they, they were warning the operators uh, that they are tracking them and that right. they know what to do. I, I'm not sure that's exactly the type of offensive, at least mm -hmm. not the, you know, the edge of the offensive that is possible. It is a part of what they can do, and I think it's very important to remember that you don't have to combat cyber with cyber. You can do many other things, and part of it is what they are doing now, uh, uh, outing the fact that they are uh, doing that. Mm. Ellen, when, when Russia and Iran and maybe others, uh, you know, Trump has hinted at China, uh, are doing this, knowing full well that they will most likely be um, exposed, in the media. What does that say about U.S. deterrence? It seems that they don't really care about being caught. I mean, should, should the U.S. Be, be doing something different? Well, so it's interesting that this, uh, this whole trend to publicly disclosing and naming uh, nation states that are behind these malign act actions is, is actually fairly recent. Back in the Obama administration, for years, it was very difficult to get the, the government to publicly uh, name China, for instance, behind uh, cyber uh, economic espionage. And it really wasn't, in fact, the Obama administration dragged its feet on, on publicly pointing to Russia, the Kremlin, as being behind the 2016 interference campaign, even when they, they knew full well, they had known for months uh, that, that, that Russian actors were, were doing this. So I think they are belated. The government has belatedly come to the uh, conclusion that public uh, naming and shaming, if you will, is is a is is a minimal part. Is this key part of deterrence? But it's not sufficient. It is not the only thing they can and should do. Um, the, both the Obama administration and the Trump administration have begun to impose economic sanctions on um, on both Russian. Uh, 
um, spy agency officials and uh, uh, the sort of private sector trolls and organizations that have been linked to influence operations. Um, and we'll see whether any of that has actually any, any effect. There have been, we've also seen indictments by the Justice Department, by Robert Mueller, uh, indicting some of these actors for their their actions, information operations, with, again, you know, so far we haven't had any one of them being actually arrested and brought to the United States for trial. But the, the U.S. government says one of these days one of them could slip up and we could see it. I think these are the sorts of actions that uh, that are good first steps, but certainly I think the experts will say you need to take more severe actions, maybe more um, pointed economic sector related uh, sanctions to have a real impact that will cause some, impose some costs right. on the Kremlin in the long term. Georgia, kind of, the, you know, what, what should the U.S. be doing here? Because it seems, it almost feels like the U.S. is playing this whack the mole here. Uh, will the hackers always have the upper hand? Well, when it comes to their abilities relative to the defense in the cyber realm, hackers clearly have the advantage, uh, and it's very difficult for us to be able to prevent offensive cyber hackers from actually penetrating the, the systems that they're attempting to penetrate. But uh, I would say also that we're still feeling our way forward on how to respond to this kind of activity. What actually deters? Mm. Um, and I think some of the naming and shaming that Ellen referred to is our effort to try to grope forward towards something that will be more effective in imposing penalties on uh, the other side on this stuff. I think the other thing we, we need to consider, however, is when you deter someone, you want simultaneously to impose costs for bad behavior, but also hold out the prospect of rewards for good behavior. Mm. And so far, we've only paid attention to one side of this, the penalties. Uh, we've not asked ourselves if the Russians actually, or the Iranians or other actors for that matter, actually comply with the behavior that we want them to comply with, what things happen that give them rewards for doing that. So far, we've imposed only cost, and we seem to have indicated that those costs will be imposed regardless of the other side's behavior. Mm. And I think that perversely incentivizes defiance on their part. Hey, I'll just wrap it up for us. I'm kind of curious about who, what the, what's the profile of an average person hacking for the FSB or for China or, or Iran? And, and, and of all those, for example, who is more dangerous or, or, or capable of doing more harm to the United States? Well, the profile is someone who looks exactly like you and me. <laughs> they don't, they don't really? look any... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> probably you. They, it, there's many different uh, types of operators. You can be a hacker or the software developer to develop the malware that they use. You, you can be an analyst. You can be any one of uh, these types. Uh, who is the best? There are s several countries that are, are known to have better capabilities, such as Russia uh, mm. and China, North Korea. Uh, Iran is very active, is not as capable technically, at least as far as we know until now. And I didn't mention the Western countries that have very good capabilities in this field. Okay, we'll have to wrap it up there. Ellen, George, and Ayal.